Hey, so the, the next portion is, I think that we called it the, the dance hall owner's perspective from behind the bar. So we're, we're very lucky today. We're very lucky today to have uh, two dance hall owners with us. And we're also lucky that they, one is from a, has been in the dance hall business for several years. And the other has been in the dance hall business for many years. Uh, and th that's Lawrence Patam from La Poussière and Bro Bridge and Mark Falgu uh, from here in Lafayette from the Blue Moon Saloon. First off, let's, who's been to La Poussière? Let's see some hands. Who's been to the Blue Moon? All right, that's a, that's a you're a very well-traveled crowd. Uh, I applaud you. So this is Lawrence and this is Mark. <clears throat> so we, we just wanted to, it seems silly to have a discussion of this subject without actually getting a, a little bit of the story from you yourselves. Uh, so first, I'd like to hear the story, how you got into the dance hall business. And I'll, I'll start with Mark. Wow. So, um, can you hear me without the microphone? No. no? OK. All right. So. I'm better just uh, without the mic, so kind of bear with me. I'll get started, but once I get started, it's hard to stop me, okay? So um, I guess the story goes back to when my, uh, <clears throat> the last of my four grandparents died. So it's kind of like going back. They, all four of my grandparents, spoke French as their first language. I thought it was important for me to be able to continue to pass that on to my children, if and when I ever had children. I was single at the time. So um, what I did was I never took any French in high school. I was around French all the time, never took any, any type of class. I was at Lollapalooza in New Orleans 20-something years ago, and I was speaking to these two guys who came down to get their uh, master's degree from France. And when they got here, they didn't speak hardly any English. And this was like six weeks later, and then all of a sudden I'm sitting there and having this conversation with them about music, about life, about, and I'm going, wow. I said, I guess if I really want to learn, what I have to do is put myself out in that situation. I have to go ahead and put myself, immerse myself in the language to where I'm not going into class for two hours and walking out and speaking English or whatever. So with their help, I found a, a school, Alliance Francaise. I went to Nice for two months in February. I actually got to the Houston airport. There was a band from Texas that was going to Nice for Mardi Gras. And I said, well, Mardi Gras was last Tuesday. They said, yeah, but they do it a week later over there. So uh, I showed up in France for Mardi Gras. Anyway, that's the back story. So uh, I went for two months. I stayed for four months. I went back the next summer. I went back, and for about a four or five year period, I spent four or five months in Europe, in France, practicing the language, studying the language, traveling. When I couldn't travel as much as I wanted to anymore, I said, well, you know what? If I can't travel, I'd like to be around people who are, which is my idea of opening the Blue Moon guest house, the hostel. When I told people I wanted to open a hostel in Lafayette, no one quite knew what that was. Why are you doing that? Why would anybody want to rent a bed to sleep in a room with someone else that they don't know? You know, I try to explain that process to them. Um, and uh, so that was kind of a hard sell to the city planners, to the codes people, to the bank, to everybody, you know, but we worked through that. And then once we got that open, then, you know, one of the first guests we had here was uh, a retired geologist from Australia. He was the first guest author, and he showed up with an accordion, and he was here for the music. To go back, it's kind of, so this is, this is our anniversary that we opened the Blue Moon because we opened this week, 2001. So what's that? Uh, we were uh, scheduled to open up that Friday of Festival Zakadien in September and Tuesday was 9-11. So all of our reservations got canceled. I'm going, it's a hell of a way to kind of open the business. So that's, that's what I was up against uh, to start. 
So fast forward, author comes in, he's here because of the music, okay? People showed up, they come to this community for the music, for the food, for the dance. I had a little back porch. You know, it never was intended to be a music venue, it was a back porch, but people came and they had instruments and they all wanted to jam. And uh, you know, one of the things that I learned when I traveled is, traveling's not so much about the places you see, it's about the people that you meet. And you know, the, my concept with the Blue Moon is if, as, if I walked into a town at the, that I've never been to before, where would I want to do, where would I, what would I want to do at the end of the day? I'd like to walk into some place that's centrally located, clean, friendly staff. I can get um, a good night's sleep, but I can also meet fe fellow travelers, but locals at the same time. So I can compare my travel stories, but I can also get a feel of the place. And what better goes with the conversation and meeting than music and something to drink. So that was six months later, we opened the bar in the back, it started a little porch. We started doing some solo shows and some duos and some jams. And so that's kind of how I, uh, the Blue Moon kind of came about. It was an idea that I thought of what would I want to experience. And fortunately for us, 16 years later, we had enough like-minded people to uh, keep us going, so. Very good. Lawrence, how, how did you get into the business? Uh, well, a little different from Mark, I think. <laughs> it, it was handed in my lap, you know. My dad started, uh, and my mom started this business in 1955, you know, at a location right across the street from where we currently located. And I kind of grew up in there, you know I mean? Started working in there at the age of 14 to 15 years old started managing the uh, dance hall part of the uh, business uh, when I graduated from high school in 1968. So I've been involved in this uh, all this time. We've been in business uh, for 61 years. We're completing our 61st year this year. And uh, it just so happened, you know, I mean, it's something that was dear to me. You know, my first language was Cajun French. Didn't speak English till I went to school. A kind of little ridicule when you were at school talking to your friends and your your cousins and what have you in Cajun French. So that that part of the culture got eroded, you know, when you can no longer speak the Cajun French. And uh, um, but the music was there. We had Walter Mouton playing there for 44 years. Uh, his heart was set on the traditional dance hall part of the aspect. He didn't want to travel. He he had a lot of respect for the culture and kept it, kept it going for 44 years. You wouldn't dare change anything on a Saturday night. People were very conservative, you know, and they, you know, don't change anything. You didn't have to advertise because they knew they were coming there the Saturday night and we're going to have a good time, you know, and what have you. And just, just so happened that, uh, you know, still dear to me and... My objective is to try to preserve as much of it as I can, as long as I'm still able to, you know what I mean? That wasn't my primary uh, profession. I was a tax assessor for, uh, worked in the tax assessor's office for 43 years, 14 years as assessor. So that gave me a perspective on the clientele because most of our clientele was uh, family, friends, neighbors, people in the surrounding area, that's what made the, uh, you know, the, the place so popular. And uh, John covered a lot of the aspects of the Cajun culture. You know, I've heard a lot of stories about the bullpen, the uh, ladies, you know, that was at the Wild Cherry Club, you know, there's a lot of stories I, I've heard through the years, you know, the wedding dances uh, where we had to pay the, the party to come. I was a part of that, you know, I, we've done that. And a lot of things through the years. So, I mean, that's where we're at today. And uh, our primary goal is to try to at least preserve as much of it if we can for the next generation and hoping they grab it and, uh, you know, kind of, they're going to take it where they want it to go. So, uh, we hope that we, we do our part. So you, you mentioned, uh, both you guys alluded to, and, and you mentioned having a, a, another job that actually is the, the thing that allowed you to do that. But I think that most people, you know, when you think about a dance hall, what you think about is the, 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 the neon sign being on and the, the beer and the, the music and the dancing. But I, 
I always find it very interesting to hear actually about the things that happen that make all that happen. Like the, the behind the scenes, like what's a typical day that you have to get ready for, for the club to open? Well, there's a lot of things you got to do that people don't realize, you know, even though you're not open or you open a couple of days a week is, is to get all of the merchandise that you need to sell to make, uh, keep the plates in uh, tidy condition it should be for the general public. And you know, there's a lot of things uh, that you have to do if you've got maintenance. It, that, that there's so many things you got to do, you know, that people don't realize that it's, a, it's just for two Two-day event takes you all week to get ready for that. You know, I mean, uh, that that's one of the things that uh, it's a constant thing all the time. You know. Yeah, there is a uh, there is a lot of behind the uh, behind the scenes. You know, I use uh, I had a meeting with my employees this week, and um, and I meet with them everybody together three four times a year before festival before Mardi Gras before festival and. Uh, you know, we're in the hospitality business, and uh, the line that I use with my employees every time is, look, we work, we're going to work really, really hard to make this look really, really easy. People don't want to know what goes on behind the deal. They don't want to be there the next morning when I'm trying to get that toilet unplugged and I'm picking up all the cigarette butts and the uh, broken beer bottles and so forth. So facility maintenance, just, you know, we've been open for 15 years and every night that we've been open in the past 15 years, we've had live music and that's four to five nights a week. So that's a lot of music. So with just with that being said, it's a lot of maintenance that goes on just on your PA, your sound equipment there, your stage, your speakers. Um, and then the other thing is too, it's, um, it's a constant changing environment. So you know, I'm not a traditional Cajun dance hall or a Zydeco club or a blues club or a DJ or a hip hop. I'm a music club. So besides just the operation portion of it, it's the programming portion. You know, I'm not fortunate enough to be able to have the same person to come out and play every Saturday night. I know who the band's going to be. It's not like that. So I have to say, I have to kind of keep my, uh, you know, myself abreast of what's happening. Uh, my goal is always trying to bend to do a balance between showcasing our local musicians and introducing our local people to music that they may have not have seen. So there's a lot of planning that goes when you look at the calendar and the, you know, I, I, you know, I have to be, it's kind of like I have to find my quiet time and look at my calendar and figure out what bands are touring and what band from California would be best with this Cage and a Zydeco band because I need to bring the kids out that would see this rock band but also want to bring the folks that would come out to dance to the Cajun band and then all of a sudden now we've got people going wow I would have never come see that but that's really good music so um, you know there's there's a lot there's a lot that goes into it and then you know it comes to the contracting making sure the contract, because everything's ahead of, you know, and then all the music licensing fees that go along with that, the BMI ASCAP, uh, the liquor license, the noise complaints, the, you know, look, it's, there's a lot. You have to have a love for this business to be in it, but, you know, I'm fortunate to be able to do what I do, and I, uh, I've written a couple songs in my life, but, uh, you know, people always walk into the bar and they go, man, you got a great job, dude. I would love just to be able to come listen to some music and have a beer every night like that, man. You know? And for the, uh, and for the longest time, I, one of my staples was Schlitz beer. I sold Schlitz for a dollar. I did that for 10 years, you know? And one of the lines in my song is, uh, it's tough to make a living one Schlitz at a time, huh? If you're just selling a dollar beer, man, you got to sell a lot of those beers to feed your three kids. So there's a lot that goes into it. I asked that question because I've showed up unannounced at both these establishments and seen both these men drenched in sweat trying to do something uh, that more than one person should be doing. Uh, I, you guys, you both touched on uh, uh, long-standing traditions at your at your at your venues, and we uh, very shortly here we'll be given an award to Walter Mouton uh, and. I, won't, I wonder if I could get you to talk just a little bit about Walter and the, lo the long-running run there. And then, Mark, I would, I would like for you to talk about the Wednesday night jam sessions, because I think that's a very important aspect. 
Well, Walter started at a very young age, you know what I mean? He was a down-to-earth guy, you know, he had a day job, so music wasn't his professional uh, attribute, but he loved the music so much, you know, and loved the people, and, uh, you know, that, that relationship with us started in the 1960s, late 60s, and, you know, every other Saturday for about 15 years, then every Saturday thereafter for, you know, a total of 44 years. I mean, he was dedicated to his stuff. He, 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 wouldn't, uh, he, he wouldn't travel. He wouldn't travel because he didn't want to leave that job. You know, he, he, he was concerned about his people. If he had left one or two times, that the people would get upset. You know, they, they, they didn't like the idea until he started traveling later in life. But uh, in the early part, no. And every Saturday night, he was the, the guy. He was called the power of the Cajun music, you know, I mean, dance hall music. And he was, you know, when the uh, dance hall era during the 1970s, early 80s, was the height of the dance hall era when you had Walter Mouton, Scott Playboy, uh, Aldous Roger and Lafayette Playboy, Belton Richard. And you had dance halls within... Uh, gobbed of them within a 10 mile radius and everybody was jam packed every night, you know, so I mean and Musicians when they were off they were coming down to uh, La Poussière to listen to Walter Mouton to kind of emulate what he was doing so No, he was a big part of our success story also so I give kudos to him and he deserved that award The Wednesday night jam at the moon is that that where I'm going well Part of, the, uh, part of the thing is when I opened the moon, it was always meant to be, it, it wasn't about being a bar. I didn't want to be a bar. I didn't want to be a bar. I, and I traveled because I like to meet people and I like to learn about other cultures. cultures. So it was, it was a, there was a cultural aspect to it also. So there's so many musicians here, obviously, you know, we talked about that. And we also talked about that so many people travel here for the music, but they are not just to listen to music, they want to play music. So they bring their instruments. So there was a jam going around town. It moved to several different places. And then probably 12 years ago, uh, Wednesday nights, it started, uh, it started at the moon. And um, it's a really special place because, you, you know, we have, a, we have a group of regulars. And then like anything else, your regulars kind of tend to change over time. You know, I mean, that's the one thing about the bar business. You got to keep your, you got to keep your regulars fresh because, you know, that's people socialize, they meet, they get married, they don't come anymore, you know what I mean? So you gotta, I'm kind of, yeah, like, like Bud, exactly, you know? So I'm kind of like the McDonald's, you know, those kids see those golden arches when they're that big, it's ingrained in their head, so I've got to start bringing these people in at 18 to try to get them in to appreciate live music and to see the performance. And one of the things that Jams has done for my guests coming in is they'll pull up a chair and sit down and they go, oh shit, man, is that whoever, is that Steve Riley, is that Wilson Savoy, is that Cedric, is that, you know, Horace, is there like, okay, well, man, I'm listening to your record, I'm coming here to maybe see you, and now I'm sitting here playing with you. I mean, to be able to have that experience is just in itself, you know, that's priceless. But at the other side, too, is I've got a lot of local people who've met, and there's so many bands that have spawned from the jam, where people met and started playing together, and next thing you know, they're going, hey man, look, we got a band now, so instead of us coming on Wednesday, why don't you pay us to come play here on uh, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, you know? Um, and then the one thing about that too is the jam and um, what the moon has done with the jam and just the community that we've created is, I've had Philippe Biadeau from uh, Fufule tell me this, it's like, you know, when they were kids, They've been playing since they were 12 years old and they've been playing, you know, and it's like, and it goes, before the moon came, we were always like the, we were the novelty act playing in the restaurant, you know what I mean? People were kind of like looking at us and they were going, oh, wow, that's cool. Look at what those little kids can do. He says, but until we played here, it's like, we felt we were kind of validated for who we were and what we were doing was actually cool. They had people who were our age who came to see us and were like, we were able to kind of spread that music to a whole nother generation because we had the outlet of the place to do it. So that's kind of, um, I mean, and that's the same thing we talked about earlier with bringing two different bands together. It's all about building community and you bring people in together and you never know what those, uh, what that mixture will uh, lead to. 
speaking of community, it, it's a, you, you have two very different crowds. Uh, anybody who's been to both these places, you, you, you realize that this is very, there's a, a divide here between these crowds. Um, but I, I would kind of like for you to talk about, like I, when I'm at La Poussière, I meet people that drive from all over the state to come to a dance. And, and also from other countries. And it's the exact same thing when I'm at the Blue Moon. And so if you could just kind of give, a, give us an idea who your crowd is and who are some of those just outstanding special guests, you know, that you might meet at any, any given weekend. Well, you know, early on, it, it was mostly uh, family, friends, neighbors, you know, and I think evolved and, uh, you know, we, the music got exposed to the outside world. We started getting people traveling from all over the state, all over the country, all over the world, you know what I mean? Uh, it just, uh, you know, that just every weekend, uh, you know, like last weekend, people from West Virginia, from Florida, from uh, upstate New York, uh, you know I mean, they, they come from all walks of life now. You know, it's not just family, friends, neighbors, we get these, but uh, our local crowd, they're dwindling because, you know, as they get older, that younger generation not coming in and uh, experiencing it, but the outsiders are loving it, you know. And we've been having to do change up a little bit to get different uh, groups in to try to get in that different thing like Steve Riley, Pine Leaf Boys, you know, De La Fonte, we, stuff we hadn't had to do in years, you know what I mean? Uh, Mr. Walter was there for 44 years, you know, we never had to worry about a Saturday. Now you got to work at trying to get the right, like Mark said, getting the right mix in there to get the right people in. And that's the challenges we, we face right now. When, um, when people come and they say, so tell, tell me about it. What kind of crowd do you have? What's your, uh, you know, and I always say my demographic is uh, it's 18 to 80. You know, on any given night, you know, it's, it's, it's and, and I have people, it, it's, it's kind of the festival concept that carries on, you know, 52 weeks out of the year. Like you'll go to the festival this weekend and you've got the grandkids dance with the grandparents and everywhere in between, okay? And we all get along and that's just normal for us. That's the way we are. That's carried over in the, uh, at to the, in the moon. That's kind of, I mean, granted, there'll be certain nights where certain bands will bring in a specific crowd, but, you know, it's not unusual for, you know, like people come in from wherever, California, you name it, whatever, and they're sitting there, cute little girl with her boyfriend, you know, and this old man walks up to her, and he's, and he's like, my God, man, look at, that would never happen where I'm from, you know? I mean, that's just... You know, my, number one, an old man wouldn't ask my girlfriend to dance. Number two, she wouldn't. But over here, it's just something about it. When you look at the energy that's being put out by the crowd, Pud said this to me years ago at a festival time, you know, when it's packed in there and looking around, he says, man, this would never fly in Alabama. Uh-uh. There'd be fights. There'd be people. There'd be, a, there'd be a mess over here. And it's just something about the energy. And you walk in, and that's kind of what we try to do is create that atmosphere where people walk in, they feel comfortable. And if you look at it and there's no pretension going around or everybody there is just to have fun, no judgment, then, you know, everybody, so everybody's comfortable there. It may not be, you know, it's like anything else. You can't be all to all people. It's like, man, your dance floor is not big enough. Oh, man, they're smoking right there. Oh, man, you know, I wish you'd have uh, another speaker out there. You should do this in the back. It's like, you're always going to have that. But for what it is, it's more than just, uh, yeah. It's more than just a, a dance floor. It's, it's, um, it's like I said, I keep coming back to community, but if, if it wouldn't be for the people locally and around the world who supported it for this time, we, we wouldn't be here, so. For the last question, I kind of wanted to ask, what do you see the, the future? What, what do you see, what, like what, I always tell people, that, you know, when you go to these places, you know, dancers are great. But if dancers drink water all night, that doesn't really help with a light bill, you know. So if you don't mind, just kind of address uh, concerns and, and the future. Well, from a financial aspect, you know, when, when you, you got a crowd that's drinking water, 
versus alcohol. Yes, yeah, it had the bearing on the bottom line, you know, to keep the place going. You know, and that's the trend today. I think uh, a lot of this comes from uh, social pressures for laws that, you know, drinking and driving. Uh, and people are more conscientious now. You have to charge general admission, and these admission charges are starting to go up. So you can pay these bands. A lot of them uh, play professionally, so they de depend on that for a living, you know, and uh, one of those things. But I, I think uh, it's going to evolve. I think the next generation is going to take a lot of the historic uh, historical stuff, and they're going to do their own thing, just that, like they did with the music. The music is ne never going to die because you've got a lot of young musicians out there that are doing their thing and, and keeping that part of it alive. And I think eventually maybe the dance halls might get, the numbers are going to dwindle quite a bit, you know. But uh, I think it's going to come back in some form or other, like uh, in the art community, you know, you're going to have these uh, kind of things that are going to come back. That, that's my feeling. It's, uh, it's an interesting time, you know. I mean, 60 years is, you know, it's amazing. And I think part in 15 years, I've been here 15 years, you know, that's a long time in this day and age to be a couple of establishments that are under the same management, the same families that have run that, you know, consistency, consistency. Um, because it, like I said, it, it's a passion and it is getting tough. I tell you, I, and I say this and I don't mean this in any offense to people from Lafayette, but because I love Lafayette and I wouldn't live anywhere else, but there's not a whole lot of imagination in this town. If people see something that works, too bad there's only one Walter because they'd have yours on Saturday night down the road. You know what I'm saying? So it's like if they see something that works then they go, well, if I do that, then I can, you know, I mean, Gino's the prime example. And there's so many people that hung their hat say, if I book Gino twice a month, I'll make money. Okay, when that's their business model right there. Or if I have Cajun music, then I'll make money. Downtown, you're talking about the future. This is a really interesting concept. They're going to lift a, a liquor license moratorium, special conditions. If you have live music, you'll be able to get a liquor license. Okay? So what does that do? That takes the same bands that are playing, puts them in 12 spots instead of 4 spots. It takes the 400 people that are downtown that are willing to pay to see live music twice a week and spreads them from those 4 spots to 12 spots. And I tell this to people all the time who want to get into the music business. And I said, listen, I mean, this is a cold hard fact. You, you, have, to, you have to be realistic. And literally, you're going to have about 400 people in this downtown area that are willing to pay to see live music. I'm not talking about Festival Weekend or Mardi Gras or whatever. And if your business, and if you can't make, you know, if you, you can't be in the black off of your share of that 400 people, then don't even think about doing it. Because your concept or your new idea, you know, it's like a, you know, dance hall, Grant Street, they make a killing because two nights, hey, grand opening and going out of business, grand opening, going out of business. They're like Brown's Furniture, you know? I mean, I hate to say that. That's, you know, everybody's gonna come the first time and everybody's gonna go the last time, but it's what you do in between. So the consistency is the, uh, the hard part. So, I mean, where do I see it? I think that myself as a business owner, I have to keep evolving. I have to keep ahead of the curve. I have to keep being innovative in my programming and what I do and my events that I do there and make it more that every night is not just a concert. It is an event. It's a, you have a reason to go just to see, besides just seeing a band. And, um, it's tough, but it's a challenge. It's what I love to do. And, you know, the, like I said, I think the biggest thing is if we can stay consistent to who we are, not necessarily what we program, but who we are and the experience we're trying to get out there, then, uh, then we'll be okay. So. All right. Thank you, guys. So once again, Lawrence Patam from La Poussière and Bro Bridge and Mark Falgu from Blue Moon Saloon. After festival this weekend you should go to both these places <clears throat> and when you do make sure you buy beer you don't have to drink them you can just leave them sitting on the bar if you if that's what you need to do <clears throat> thank you guys 
So, next, we have a... a, a uh, by the way, uh, if you leave those beers on the table, somebody's going to come and recap them and, and make them. Beer. Thank you. Uh, I was yeah, exactly. I appreciate that. Well, I thought you were going to say I will come along and drink them. But <laughs> that's true, too. Um, so right now we, we have a really short presentation, and it's uh, honoring Walter Mouton, who we've been discussing a, a good bit today. And... I want to give a second to, I have to run get the plaque, but I want to give a second to Barry to talk about the CD, uh, which has okay. come out this year. Okay. Uh, you heard a lot, of a lot of talk about Walter Mouton today because we were talking about dance halls, and you know, um, <clears throat> we, he's been described as a, a musician's musician. He's been described as uh, the, king of the, the, uh, the current king of the dance halls. There have been others, and Walter would, would insist that I mention also, you know, people like um, Lawrence Walker, and uh, earlier Ira Lejeune, and uh, later uh, um, Aldous Roger and the Life of Play. There, were, there have been these guys who just, you know, just made the dance. The dance hall was home field. It was, uh, it was, it was, uh, it's what they did. And uh, but in our day and age, for the last 40 years, it's been Walter Mouton, and he's been described as, as I said, you know, king of the dance halls. Um, I don't know that I would. Maybe King of the Dance Halls is okay. Workhorse <laughs> is another way to put it. He was out there every Saturday night doing it since he was this big in short pants. And all of that time, all of that time playing live music faithfully for people who depended on what he did to define their week. And, and you know, make, make available what they did socially. All of that time, he recorded one 45. You remember those old 45s? A song on each side? One. Scott Playboy Special and the Lonely Girls Waltz. And he told me, he told lots of people, uh, that he really just did not like the recording studio experience for several reasons. Um, one of them was it felt kind of constrained, and the, but, but also he told me recently, I, you know, I, I really, I didn't care for my music too much. You know, it sounded artificial. I like, my, I like the way I sound live. And I said, well, we've got years of you live <laughs> at festivals like idea. And so we, uh, we put out this, uh, oh, there they are. Uh, we, we compiled this CD of um, 17 songs recorded live at Festival Zakadia Creole from 1992 to 2014 through the years, and you can hear the evolution of the bands, you can hear all the different people that he played with uh, through the years, um, and, uh, and we always, we, we tried in as many cases as we could to uh, include the, the crowd reactions, and so you, you give you the sense of being there, standing in front of the stage and listening, and uh, you can almost you almost cough from the dust uh, as you listen to this. So, Mr. Walter would like to come. Up, uh, could you come up and uh, receive these two things? One, his very first CD. And many, many have said, many would say it's high time. Uh, and I, I have to, can I, I just take a second? I have a, uh, oops. We did a little, there's a little booklet in here and uh, uh, I did an interview with Walter. And at one point he said, um, <clears throat> People have been on me for quite a few years uh, for me to leave them something to listen to. So I guess this is going to be something. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be something. And uh, we're very, very... We, uh, Festivals Academia Creole in the Center for Louisiana Studies, um, uh, uh, Cajun Creole Folklore Archive, were extremely proud and honored 
that you agreed to work with us on this project. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for letting us do this. <laughs> and so I have a, a, the first copy of Hot Off the Press for you. Yeah. <laughs> this is the first time I see it. It just it just arrived. It just arrived about about an hour and a half ago, uh, delivered to the front of the Vermillionville uh, steps. So uh, <clears throat> this additionally is an, an award from the Lieutenant Governor's Office, uh, supported in part by a grant from Louisiana Division of the Arts, the Office of Cultural Development. Uh, Department of Cultural Recreation and Tourism in cooperation with Louisiana State Arts Council and the National Endowment for the Arts, Artworks. <clears throat> and all that is great, but uh, Festival and Center for Louisiana Studies bought the frame. Well, I guess this means I'm a, a little important. <laughs> uh, through the years, uh, I heard Lawrence saying they had people coming from all over. I traveled quite a bit to festivals and places like that, and everywhere I went, I made sure to leave them a message that if they ever came through, through uh, Louisiana on I-10 to stop in in Bro Bridge and visit La Poussière. I had, uh, that's maybe 40 somewhat years ago, just about every Saturday, I was pulled into a corner and for an interview for different magazines, books, and this and that. Uh, that went on for quite a few years when Cajun music was spreading. And it, it made me feel good that they, they saw fit to ask me about it. Uh, I've had to answer questions like, uh, do you have any alligators in your backyard? And <laughs> a few places, but uh, that comes with the territory. And thank you for this, this black, it'll be cherished. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, additionally, a, a small monetary token. That's a check in there. 